Hello, today's video will be about cache poisoning. First, we'll take a look how it was possible to redirect all our abuse reports on GitHub to completely innocent victim and later we'll see how Firefox updates could be completely disabled. The whole video is based on an excellent research done by James Kettle. Links to his white paper and his talk are in the description. Enjoy! Let's start by explaining why do we even use cache. When a user opens a website, the request travels like this, through the reverse proxy to the application server. Sometimes the application server has to process the request before sending the response. However, many times the request is very simple and can be the same for all users, for example index.html. In such case, the same response can be returned every single time without consuming a precious time of application server. That's exactly what shared cache does and make sure to not confuse it with the local cache that is stored inside your browser. Sometimes the server tells us if the response comes from cache or not by using hit or miss in headers. If not, we can determine it based on the time because the response from the cache will be much quicker. But how does it actually cache it? The application server sends headers that tell the cache server whether he can store a specific response or not. For example, a request to a resource that only we have access to must never be cached. But when headers allow it, the cache server saves the response before sending it to this particular user and then it stores it for a specified amount of time. Then, for each request, it has to decide whether he can use a cached response or he has to forward the request to the application server. That's when a cache key is being used. It's a signature of a request based on which the cache server decides what to do. A simple cache key could look like this. And if all those parameters match, then the cache server decides that it can respond with a saved response. The inputs that are included in the cache key are called kit inputs and all the other ones are unkit inputs. And the idea behind web cache poisoning attacks is to find an unkit input that will be ignored by the cache server but will be considered by the application server. For example, many PHP applications support X original URL header. So both requests on the screen will be treated the same way by the PHP server, but they will have completely different cache key. In such case, we can poison the cache using such a request. So when a legitimate user tries to visit index.html, he will get a response from cache from the path specified by us. But where is the impact, you may ask? The easy way of exploiting such issues is to increase the impact of reflected cross-site scripting or unexploitable XSSs. But more often than not, you will not have an XSS and in such case, you need to get creative. Let's see how James got creative on GitHub's website. This is a standard get request. Parameters are where they always are, which is in the URL. And how about this request? It seems valid, but do you think that web application servers will actually use those parameters? Turns out that some frameworks do, and one of them is Ruby on Rails, which was used to develop GitHub website. If you send such request, then GitHub will prioritize the parameters from the body, but Varnish cache server will use the parameter from the URL in its cache key. This way you can poison any parameterized request with arbitrary values. What could you do with it on GitHub? For example, there is a report abuse functionality. And you could poison the URL that would be used 
to report your account and redirect the abuse report to completely innocent victim. You could also manipulate filters, deny access to topics or disable the row button on files. GitHub paid for this report $10,000. Many times you can use cache poisoning to cause denial of service. This is often not very impactful and not very welcome by triagers. However, in my next example, you could disable updates for Firefox browser, which would be critical in case if there would be a fix for zero day vulnerability, keeping all the users insecure. URI normalization is a process that is supposed to catch and normalize all the URIs that are written slightly differently but at the end meet the same address. For example, the process of normalization might include URL decoding the address. And Firefox servers use Nginx for caching. And the problem was that in such case Nginx would forward the request to the application server without any normalization while the cache key is being URL decoded. It means that both of these requests would have the same cache key. But only the first one is valid. It's sent every time you start up your Firefox browser to check if there are any updates available. While the second one without URL decoding will be considered completely invalid path. In such case, the server, instead of returning a 404 not found, it will redirect the user to main Mozilla page. And if you poison the cache this way, all the requests that are meant to check for updates will not actually check for updates at all. And Firefox paid $5,000 for this vulnerability. And that's it for today's video. If you like the cache poisoning attacks, go see James's talk on this topic. The link is in the card as well as in the description down below. And if you like my explanations, go watch other videos on my channel. But for now, thanks for watching and goodbye.